Thank you, Vincent. It was a great way to start. So Vincent's talked a lot about the change we need to make in the world, and I want to introduce you to Chad Frischman. Chad's the Vice President and Director of Research at Project Drawdown. And I found Chad's work about a year ago, and I fell in love with this book, Project Drawdown. I should have one right now. But the book combined practical solutions, real action, and a vision for really changing how we're working with climate. It was closing the gap between scientists, artists, environmentalists, and us as the restaurant world. So I'm so excited to welcome Chad Frischman on stage. I have to tell you one more thing. There was a little while when I was carrying the book around in my suitcase, and I gave a copy. I was giving copies away. That's how good this book is. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for having me here today. I'd like to introduce you to a word you may never have heard of, but you ought to know. Drawdown. Drawdown is a new way of thinking about and acting on global warming. It's a goal for a future that we want, a future where reversing global warming is possible. Drawdown is that point in time when atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases begins to decline on an annual basis. More simply, it's that point when we take out more greenhouse gases than we put in to the atmosphere. And the proposition is really rather simple. If we can reduce concentrations of greenhouse gases, we can affect global cooling, a reversal of human-induced glo uh, uh, human global warming. We're all concerned about climate change, right? But climate change is not the problem. Climate change is the effect of the problem. It's the feedback of the planet telling us what's going on. The problem is global warming, provoked by the increasing concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So how do we solve the problem? How do we reverse global warming? Drawdown is the only way we know how to avoid putting greenhouse gases up and to pull down what's already there. But perhaps it sounds daunting. But what if I were to tell you Humanity already knows what to do. We have the technologies and practices today that, when taken together, can achieve drawdown. Project Drawdown has mapped, measured, and modeled 80 existing solutions that, when taken together, can begin the process of reversing global warming. And we've mapped 20 coming attractions. These are solutions that are on the pipeline, and when they come offline, will accelerate the process. These technologies and practices do one or more of three things. Replace existing fossil fuel-based energy generation with clean, renewable sources. To reduce consumption through technological efficiencies and behavior change. And to biosequester carbon and our plants, biomass, and soils through a process we all learn about in grade school called photosynthesis. It is a combination of these three mechanisms that makes drawdown possible. Humanity already knows what to do. What we lack is the will to do it. But why? Why is that the case? Well, we've done a great job behind the science around the problem and the effect around global warming and climate change. But that science is complicated. It's complex, technical, too distant for most people to act upon. And at the same time, we're inundated with stories of doom and gloom. Terrifying headlines and horrifying images designed to provoke fear and panic, disempowerment. And when we're confronted by fear, what do we do? We run away. 
We distract ourselves, right? The apocalypse is upon you, and there is nothing you can do about it, so you might as well order some discounted wine and take away, <laughs> right? But it's this combination of fear, disempowerment, and conf- distance with the science that results in apathy, an indifference to the status quo. And when we're confronted with fear and apathy, well, we know these are the tools of oppression, right? But Project Drawdown was created to change that discourse, to reframe it to one of understanding, possibilities, and therefore opportunities. If global warming is happening to us, we're victims. But if it's happening for us, it's a turning point to create the future that we want. Now, of course, positive messaging alone isn't going to get us there. So Project Radon is not only a communications organization, but a, a living research program that rests on the foundation of data-driven, credible information on solutions to reverse global warming. We have brought together a team of researchers from all over the world. Over 65 researchers have taken part in this project over four years. 50% of them have PhDs. All have one or more master's degrees. But the thing is, we're not a bunch of data wonks and climate scientists. Well, we are. We do. We love data. Don't get me wrong. But we come from a diversity of perspectives, from business, from law, human rights, sustainable development, engineering, architecture, forestry. It's that combination of perspectives that we bring to this issue that allows us to address the solution to the problem. We need those diversity of perspectives. And what do we all do? Well, we map, measure, and model technologies and practices that together can reverse global warming. But rather than produce another technical report, a complicated scientific manual, we produced a book called Drawdown that was published in April of last year. This is just a spread of one of the solutions we profile, rooftop solar. You may have heard, you may know about solar, right? Think about this book. Think about these, this, this uh, rooftop solar. It's a story about solutions. It's a narrative. It's a designed to engage and empower the reader, not distance them from the science. I like to think of this as the kind of book that you can take to the park on a Sunday and enjoy your day. It's the kind of book you can read before bed and not have a nightmare. <laughs> I mean, how many books about global warming or climate change can you say that? Think about it. But what do the results actually say? Here's just a short list of the top 20 solutions. Now take a few seconds just to look over that. To the left, you'll see some numbers that represent the total equivalent carbon dioxide either avoided or removed from the atmosphere by 2050 in terms of gigatons. That's a billion tons of carbon dioxide avoided or removed. Now, when we think about climate solutions, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Maybe coal-fired plants, gas-fired plants. We think about electricity generation. But one of the first things to note is uh, only five of the top 20 solutions have to do with electricity, right? The number one solution is refrigeration. This is how we manage and destroy hydrofluorocarbons, HFCs. These are refrigerants that are used in air conditioners and refrigerators to cool the air. Why is it important? Well, hydrofluorocarbons are hundreds to thousands of times more potent, a greenhouse gas, than carbon dioxide. And what happens to the appliances that we all use, they leak these hydrofluorocarbons over time. And at the end of life, what do we do? We throw them into the landfill. 
where they leak and contribute to global warming. But we can change that. It's actually rather simple. The Montreal Protocol also did a great job with limiting chlorofluorocarbons because of the ozone layer, do you remember that? But what was replaced by chlorofluorocarbons was hydrofluorocarbons, right? So if we can manage to control that leakage and destroy them, almost 90 billion tons of carbon dioxide can be avoided. And land use is also incredibly important. Four of the top 20 solutions relate to how we manage our ecosystems, how we manage our forests, wetlands, and currently degraded land. We can think about trees as giant sticks of carbon. Right? This is drawdown in action every year. As trees sequester carbon, pull it down from the atmosphere through, a pro through photosynthesis, and store it and safeguard it in biomass and soil organic carbon. But what surprised us is that eight of the top 20 solutions relate to the food system. Now, the climate impact of food may come as a surprise to many. It came to a surprise to us to have so many of them. But what this shows us is that the decisions that we make every day on how we produce, consume, and waste food is perhaps the most impactful solution every individual can make to reversing global warming. Who knew? Now, what do we need to do? Well, first of all, we need to change how we produce food away from modern agricultural practices that focus on monoculture, synthetic fertilizers and pesticides that ultimately degrade land towards regenerative practices. We model 13 different types of regenerative agricultural production methods. This is regenerative agriculture, one of those 13. This is a combination of reduced or no tillage, cover cropping, crop rotation, manure or compost application, and organic practices, right? Well, what this does is instead of degrading land, it restores carbon to the soil. It improves water retention. It increases soil health and fertility and improves livelihoods of smallholders and large-scale farming operations alike. But the great thing is, this is not some kind of newfangled idea. We've been practicing regenerative agriculture for hundreds of years. In fact, it's what, how we used to produce food. And it's been displaced by modern agricultural practices. Regenerative agriculture is a win, 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 win. It just keeps going, right? But it's not just how we produce food. We have to think about what we are consuming. The number four solution to reversing global warming is a plant-rich diet. Now, this is not a vegetarian or a vegan diet. I applaud any of you who are. We, don't, we kind of take a conservative perspective on it. We try to instead show a healthy diet. Right? That means a, a healthy consumption of meat and an increased consumption of, of plant-based proteins. Right? It's about reducing our consumption overall and raising the consumption in those countries that are deficient. Because that's the case. We have to think about where we are in the world. In high-income countries, we overconsume greatly. But in low-income countries, it's the exact opposite. That needs to be rebalanced, right? And when we rebalance that situation, we get uh, plant-rich diets, right? one of the most substantive solutions to reversing global warming. But it's not just what we consume, it's how we consume it. Reduced food waste is the number three solution, with nearly 70 billion tons 
can be reduced. Now, approximately one-third of all food is wasted. It accounts for about 8% of the world's global greenhouse gases. 8%. If we were to add it all up and compare it to different countries, it would be number three after the United States and China, global food waste, right? But we have to think about where on the supply chain that waste and loss happens, because that allows us to understand what kind of solutions there are. In low-income countries, they don't waste food at market or consumption. After it leaves the farm, most food in low-income countries is wasted or lost during processing and packaging or distribution. It's an infrastructure and technology problem that we can solve. In high-income countries, it's the opposite. After food leaves the farm, most food is wasted at the point of market and consumption. Nearly 20 to 30% of food wasted. And it's not a technology problem. It's a consumer choice. And why is it the case that food is so important? If we think about reduced food waste and plant-rich diets and all these regenerative practices, why is it so important? Well, every seed, every drop of oil, every crust of bread is embodied with greenhouse gas emissions. Carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, methane, fluorinated gases like hydrofluorocarbons, all along the supply chain from production to dis packaging, distribution, market, our restaurants, our refrigerators, all the way to the landfill where food decomposes and releases methane, which is many times more potent than carbon dioxide. Every bit of food we produce is embodied with those emissions. But here's the surprising thing. If we adopt all of these 13 regenerative agricultural practices, we adopt a plant-rich diet, and we reduce our food waste, right? We do it all in parallel over time. We would produce enough food today on current farmland to feed the world's population a healthy, nutrient-rich diet now until 2050 and beyond without having to cut down any new forest. When we think of the food system as a solution to reversing global warming, we also solve our food security problems. Right? Who knew? So you might be asking yourselves, is drawdown possible by 2050? It's certainly ambitious. But the answer is yes, it is possible. But there are no silver bullets. The top 10 aren't going to get us there. The top 20, nope. Top 30, 40, 50, not going to get us there. We need all 80 existing solutions to be adopted in parallel as a system, a system uh, of solutions in parallel. And together, that can, we can achieve drawdown. We can start the process of reversing global warming by adopting all 80 of these solutions, and we also need to innovate. We do. We need to innovate and bring those coming attractions back on online to accelerate the, pro the process, because we need to move fast. But the good thing, the great thing about this, this set of solutions, we want them whether or not global warming was a problem. Renewable energy is about clean, abundant, resilient energy for all. It's about air pollution. Family planning, educating girls, is about gender equity. It's about human rights. It's about improved livelihoods. It's about justice. Regenerative agriculture, managed grazing, silvopasture, tropical tree staple crops. 
This is about restoring carbon to the land, about improving soil health and fertility. Right? This results in improved livelihoods for smallholders and far large scale farming operations, benefits the lives of farmers all over the world. Protecting our forests and wetlands also protects biodiversity and the intrinsic value of our ecosystems. It protects the oxygen that we breathe. Right? A plant rich diet, reduced food waste, results in a healthy, nutrient rich uh, food system to feed the world's population. These are solutions we would want anyway. And if you take these solutions together as a system, what we see is that there's a shift, a shift in the system, a shift in the way we do business from one that is inherently exploitative and extractive to a new normal that is restorative and regenerative by nature. This set of solutions is the future that we want. Reversing global warming is a welcome co-benefit. Thank you.